uh, what I'm going to be covering here in my talk today is a set of a set of topics which uh, of which I'm really only an expert in one of them. So I I know the technology part of uh, of ocean exploration quite well. Uh, you know the climate and ocean piece of it I've worked in. Um, but I have colleagues who know far more than I do. And the geopolitics in the ocean, well, for me, the geopolitics are closely tied to the economics, uh, prosperity, and wealth of the, of the world and, and, of course, of the nation. So, so those are items where I will freely admit, I'm sure there are people on here who, who uh, may have more expertise than I do. But what I will try to do is weave these all together um, to tell a, a bit of a story about how the ocean is changing, changing dramatically in our lifetime, uh, how that impacts us uh, from, a, uh, from, a, from the perspective of, of prosperity. Uh, we're finding ourselves uh, increasingly tied to the ocean. Uh, the ocean, as I, I like to think of it, shows up in our living rooms and kitchens far more than, than it has uh, in the past. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the industries and technologies which are enabling all of this. And finally, we'll have some thoughts about what it means for national security and for a, a safer, uh, a safer, uh, more prosperous country. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, of course the US is a maritime nation. Uh, you know, we sometimes, sometimes forget that. Uh, you know, I spent quite a bit of my life up in the New England area, and uh, the whole coast of uh, the whole coast of New England, and indeed the entire eastern seaboard, used to be studded with shipyards. And those shipyards produced merchantmen; uh, they produced uh, warships uh, and uh, very capable warships. Here's a, a picture from uh, of the Constitution, not the one which is in Baltimore Harbor, but the original frigate, the Constitution, uh, fighting an engagement in the late 1700s. At the time that this occurred, uh, the oceans were largely a, 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 a sort of a highway, if you will, to other to other areas of the planet. Uh, they were a barrier, if you will, to your opponents. Uh, they were a place where you fought battles. Uh, naval battles, uh, but largely in support of uh, terrestrial activities. And the, the primary the primary resource that you extracted from the ocean were fish. Uh, and of course, the interior of the ocean was largely invisible to us. Now, the other thing to say is that, you know, at the time that this painting, uh, the, the events in this painting occurred, uh, we were just in the period of what, what I think some historians think of as the second great age of ocean exploration, uh, where, uh, you know, Captain Cook had, had been uh, roving the Pacific, uh, discovering islands, uh, almost discovering Antarctica, and sort of filling in the map, right, between the continents. Uh, today, if you move to the next slide, we're in another great age of ocean exploration, and uh, it's really being driven by uh, our increased access to the ocean via robotic systems. At the upper left-hand corner uh, are the systems that have really revolu you know, really have become uh, the workhorses, if you will, both for the scientific community uh, and for, for industry, for working in the deep ocean. Uh, in fact, it was really the energy industry that carried these remotely operated vehicles, which can weigh many tons uh, and which are connected by a cable. Uh, you know, the smaller ones have a cable sort of the size of a garden hose. Some of the ones in the oil and gas industry have enormous cables. Uh, that are connecting these vehicles uh, to ships, uh, often operating at depths of many thousands of meters. So if you think about flying across country uh, and looking out your window, you, you know, it's not that dissimilar from the types of distances that the ship is above these platforms in the deep ocean. That cable, of course, is enormously expensive. It's probably the most complex part of this whole system. Uh, and so getting rid of the cable has been an interest for an, a long time. Uh, and as a consequence, as you look across here uh, to the right, what you see are everything from very small vehicles in the top center as part of the Argos array. Uh, you know, those are, you know, what 
passes for inexpensive in the ocean environment in the way of instrumentation and very long lasting. Argo floats have lasted five years or so, and they're part of basically the thermometry of the ocean, uh, the ocean itself as uh, what tells us what's going on uh, with, with the ocean in a physical sense. Uh, we have also autonomous underwater vehicles, you know, lower left, which have propellers on them. Uh, those tend to be, uh, don't have the endurance. So they carry much more comprehensive and sophisticated uh, payloads. And they've been largely dependent on ships, although that's changing. And then as you move to the right, you have satellite systems, uh, you have uh, moorings, which are anchored to the seafloor. And on the far right, the beginning of instrumentation, very sophisticated instrumentation that is installed on the seafloor, left on the seafloor, and sometimes cabled back to shore so that you can operate it. Uh, from uh, uh, from a uh, terrestrial environment, from your control room. So these robotic systems are really sort of changing our ability to interact with the ocean. I will say that I'm not going to talk a lot about the technology, uh, not as much as I normally would, having given a talk earlier which focused heavily on marine technology. But I did want to give a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a, an overview of some of the constraints. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, some of the big challenges that you have of working in the environment, uh, the ocean environment, is number one, water is very dense. Uh, it's uh, almost a thousand times denser than air uh, at sea level. Uh, and so as a consequence, if you go through the drag calculation, what you find is it costs you roughly that much more energy in order to move through that environment. And what happens is a consequence is because uh, because we can't really uh, uh, supply that kind of energy on marine robotic systems, we tend to move much slower. And so you take advantage of that V cube term in the propulsion power uh, uh, calculation. The other problem you have in the ocean is you don't have much oxygen. And so you can't do the cheats that we do in the atmosphere, which is uh, to carry only half of the fuel, uh, you know, so which is what you're doing with a gasoline engine, right? You're pulling the oxygen out of the atmosphere. And so as a consequence, uh, if you look at the effective energy density of the systems that you're using in the undersea environment, which are largely battery systems, we're very heavily dependent on lithium, uh, rechargeables these days, uh, you're literally looking at something like a factor of 70 difference in uh, the effective energy density of the system. So you're very energy challenged in the ocean. Of course, you're building systems that are going to great depth and you have roughly an atmosphere of pressure every 10 meters. And of course, the deepest part of the ocean is nearly uh, 30,000 uh, meters deep. Seawater is a conductor, so electrical, uh, uh, so e electrical uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation basically doesn't penetrate for all practical purposes, so you use uh, you have to use acoustics. Uh, but the big challenge with acoustics is that acoustics is also absorbed by seawater, particularly at higher frequencies. So if you want to push sound long distances, you are forced to work at lower frequencies. And the other thing is refracted. So all of these things together cumulatively drive you towards autonomous systems. So now what I'm going to do is let me talk a little bit about the ocean and climate. So next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, we'll hop directly past the title slide to the next one after that. So uh, Sylvia Earle is fond of saying that we should call our planet, planet water, because in fact, it is mostly water. Uh, our, our, our planet is 70% ocean. And if you look at it from over the Pacific, this is what you see. You see a blue planet uh, with a little bit of land uh, around, uh, around the perimeter. Now, if you look at this, depending on how good a resolution you're, uh, th this is uh, coming over your monitor, you might think you're looking at something almost like Europa because you see a lot of lines in there. Some of those lines are real. Um, however, some of those lines are artifacts. So next slide, please. So this is a close up, oh, sorry, uh, back one. So this is a close up of one of the crossing points of a couple of those lines. And what you can see is that those lines actually are the result of multi-beam operation by ships. So uh, most of the world's ocean is very poorly mapped. As a matter of fact, it's largely uh, filled in using um, sea surface uh, satellite data. Um, there's a clever set of calculations you can do to figure out basically bottom topography. 
Um, but the real measurements that you want to make are with sonar, and uh, there's really not that many places on the planet where we have good sonar data. So as you look at the, the, the lines on here, some of those are actually geophysical features, and other ones actually are places where ships have been, and we actually have our high-resolution data. So lesson number one, our maps of the ocean actually are really quite poor. Next slide. So this is just giving you a little bit of a feeling of what the depth of the ocean is. So the average depth of the ocean, about 3,700 meters, uh, and uh, most of the ocean is what we call abyssal plains. So those abyssal plains are between sort of about 6,000 meters and 2,000 meters, and we tend to think of them as big flat areas. Um, however, as you've seen from the last image, a lot of times they're flat simply because we don't have data and we don't know what the topography is. But for the most part, they, they, that seafloor has been generated at spreading ridges. I'll tell you about those in a little bit. Um, they pushed out from the spreading ridges, gradually seeing sediments fall on them over millions of years, out to hundreds of millions of years, and you end up eventually at the edges of the ocean basin uh, with, uh, with thick layers of sediment overlying, overlying crust. So those are the abyssal plains. There's a few ocean trenches where there's subduction going on. Uh, that gets you down to hadal depths, which is sort of deeper than 7,000 meters down to about 11 kilometers. And then there's a, a reasonable amount of continental shelf. And continental shelf is sort of what's sitting off of, for example, the east coast of the U.S., but not so much the west coast. Uh, and that is in the east coast, you have an extended 100 uh, miles or so, uh, fairly shallow fairly shallow seafloor, maybe 100 meters or so out to where it drops off out to the out to the deep ocean. For the most part, continental shelf is not a really large fraction of the ocean um, until you go to the Arctic. The Arctic is almost 50% continental shelf. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that you uh, start talking about when you start talking about bathymetry is the fact that sea level is not constant. And there's a variety of re reasons why sea level is not constant. Um, one is that the Earth is still actually rearranging itself from the last ice age about uh, 11,000 years ago. Um, something called isostatic rebound is occurring as those mile thick ice, sheet, ice sheets retreated and the continents begin to rise back up and it looks like uh, water is receding. The other thing that, uh, that, that happened, of course, after the last ice age is that you melted a lot of ice and, uh, and sea level came up pretty substantially uh, because of that. There's uh, large regions of, uh, of uh, the continental shelf, for example, in areas which were, which were dry back uh, during the last ice, ice age. The other thing that's happening is you're heating, we're heating up the ocean. As we heat up the ocean, it expands. And as it expands, of course, sea level rises. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we are adding, uh, we are adding uh, uh, water uh, by melting the permanent ice sheets. And the two big reservoirs of permanent, uh, permanent ice are Greenland and Antarctica. And in fact, uh, you know, a lot of the scenarios looking at sea level rise, which kind of accumulates all of these types of things. And in that upper right-hand corner, the red part of the curve is the instrumental record. Um, you know, you think of uh, you think of sea level rise as being measured in centimeters per decade type type things, um, but uh, we're beginning to get to a point where uh, where we're beginning to have serious doubts about what's happening uh, in particularly in uh, in Antarctica with the Thwaites Glacier. Um, there is uh, there there are scientists arguing that a collapse there is possible by 2050. Uh, that would, in one sort of fell swoop, raise uh, sea level by as much as 65 centimeters. So, so these types of things have a way of accelerating. And at this point, I'll just mention that you know, having been working sort of with climate scientists since really since the late 80s. One of the constants in this is the story usually ends up being worse uh, than you think it is. So I can remember when we originally started talking about ice sheet breakup, it was uh, something that people talked about uh, with time spans of millennia. Uh, and seeing things, significant changes occur within a century was just uh, was 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 not uh, not even conceivable back uh, at those times. And and that kind of goes on and on for a variety of different uh, stories uh, that revolve around climate, including the next one. 
Um, so this is one, uh, if we go to the next slide here, uh, we'll be talking about uh, sea ice in the Arctic. So if you look, uh, look on the left-hand side there, you can see where the median ice edge and the maximum uh, sea ice uh, extent is in the Arctic uh, back around 2014, 2015. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you have a very interesting curve. And this curve sort of works its way from 1979 all the way around to 2021. And what it does is it tracks uh, the coverage, the ice coverage in, uh, in uh, thousands of square kilometers uh, by month. So that black one is September. That's when you tend to have minimum sea ice extent in the Arctic. Uh, and you can see there, it's it's uh, it it is rushing to zero very quickly in September. Um, I can remember a cruise where we went out in about 19, uh, 1996, I think it was, and at that point there was still serious discussions about whether this uh, shrinking amount of ice in the Arctic was a real was something that was really uh, a, a part of a global warming trend. Or was it something that was just uh, due to uh, wind conditions sort of piling up the ice, if you will, temporarily in, in individual parts of the Arctic? And uh, we now realize that, of course, that this is warming. And this is, by the way, one of the things that was has been very poorly captured by uh, climate models. It tends to be under underpredicted. Uh, and this, of course, is a positive feedback mechanism. You know, you remove sea ice, which is bright and shiny and reflects sunlight back into uh, back into space uh, with black sea uh, seawater, because it's comparatively speaking, it's a great solar absorber. And what happens is the less sea ice you have, the more sunlight you absorb into the seawater, the faster the heating goes and uh, the positive feedback uh, uh, the, and there's your positive feedback. So next slide. Uh, the next slide really kind of talks about the energy inputs uh, that you see. So on the left-hand side, what you're looking is the sun at the sun. Uh, and I don't know if you can see this, but you know the big red there is kind of about 300 watts per square meter. This is insulation. And what you're seeing is you're seeing it move back and forth seasonally between the northern and southern hemisphere. Now, of course, what happens is all that, that uh, energy from the sun gets pumped into the atmosphere, uh, among other places, and it drives winds. And at the bottom of the atmosphere, you can measure, uh, you can measure the wind is being dissipated against the land and against the ocean. Uh, and you can get very high uh, energy densities in effect in the wind. So this is sort of looking at close to 3,000 uh, uh, watts per square meter. Of course, here you're measuring it uh, across the land perpendicular uh, to the surface of the Earth. And then finally, where that blows over the ocean, that wind, uh, that wind builds up waves. And uh, over the ocean, uh, what you're getting is uh, an, a, basically an accumulator if you will, of that atmospheric energy, and you're getting energies of something like uh, 300, uh, 300 kilowatt hours per, per linear meter. Um, so an enormous amount of energy in the wave environment. The big challenge being uh, very large forces, very low, um, uh, comparatively low frequencies, so hard to extract. Uh, so there's a variety of, variety of different things. But these are kind of what's going on over the ocean in the way of interaction with the sun and interaction uh, with the atmosphere. Now, as a second kind of interaction with the atmosphere, and we go to the next slide, uh, what we'll see is we'll see this is in effect uh, the pickup of carbon dioxide uh, by the ocean. So one of the things that not many people realize is that the carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere is kind of only in the atmosphere temporarily until the ocean absorbs it. And what you have over here on the left hand side is a picture showing in effect uh, how that carbon dioxide, which becomes effectively carbonic acid, so it eventually it changes the pH of the ocean. So how that pH of the ocean will respond uh, as that carbon dioxide, as that excess of carbon dioxide comes out of the atmosphere and goes into the ocean. And then on the right, 
um, we talk about uh, microbial respiration. Roughly half the oxygen we breathe comes from microbes in the ocean. That's where a lot of photosynthesis is going on. And you have two big inputs there. One of the things you have is you have increasing temperatures in the ocean, creating stronger thermoclines and higher barriers to movement of organisms, which has one set of effects on organisms. And the other thing you have is you have this increasing pH, which uh, uh, both affects organisms' ability to actually build certain types of their structures, uh, but it also affects their respiration. So pH is a part of the respiration equation. And some pieces of the ocean may become dead zones in sort of about the middle of this century to uh, certain, certain organisms, uh, including some large organisms. It certainly is going to have impact on the microbial ecosystems, and we really don't understand what those, uh, what those impacts are. Next slide, please. So here, what we have is a slide on volcanism and the seafloor. And basically, the seafloor is studded with this mid-ocean ridge. And this mid-ocean ridge, for the most part, is you know, having eruptions every day, all the time. Uh, we don't really know about them because they're under kilometers at seafloor. But every once in a while, something really violent occurs, like the one that occurred out there in, uh, uh, in, the, in the Western Pacific uh, in uh, late uh, late last year. Uh, next slide, please. So here what we see is we see the mid-ocean ridge system. So this is where, in effect, uh, crust is being created. So this is sort of the newest part of the planet. Um, these are the engines, if you will, for uh, continental drift. So they're pushing the, uh, pushing the continents around. Uh, and uh, they're very interesting areas for a variety of different reasons, but uh, one of them is, is that uh, there's some truly unique life forms down there. A fabulous story to be uh, to be told about uh, these uh, photosynthetic uh, or these non-photosynthetic, these chemosynthetic communities that were discovered there in the late uh, late 70s. Um, one of the ongoing battles in ocean sciences as to who actually gets credit for that. Um, but the other thing is, is it turns out that the sulfide, there's enormous sulfide deposits at these ridges because associated with this hot, uh, you know, uh, material being delivered to the seafloor is an enormous amount of water circulation through the, uh, through the sediments and, and through the crust. And those bring uh, really interesting minerals up to the surface. And as the temperature drops, they come out, they precipitate out. So next slide. Uh, what you find is that in a lot of these places, you have big, massive sulfide deposits. And, uh, and so as a consequence, one of the big discussions has been mining. And there's several different places you can go to mine the ocean. There's uh, crustal uh, uh, deposits. There are these sulfide deposits. Uh, and there's manganese nodules uh, over parts of the Pacific. But these sulfide deposits have, for example, copper assays, which are as much as 20 times higher uh, some of the best, uh, some of the best copper uh, deposits in the terrestrial environment, uh, and it's pretty easy to extract also from from the sulfides. Uh, enormous concerns, as you can imagine, as to what actually happens to the ocean environment as you begin to extract these at scale. Um, so, next slide, please. So now I want to talk a little bit about humans in the ocean. Um, so first, the story starts with, you know, humans on the planet, and we'll kind of gradually dig into uh, how our prosperity and our, uh, our, our health as, a, as, a, as societies is, is connected to the ocean. Next slide. So first thing is, is we all know that, that, uh, that the population of the planet is growing. Um, I realize I should have put this was out of one of the US, US uh, uh, excuse me, UN population assessments. Uh, so I apologize that that uh, reference should have been there in the slide. Um, but you can see here, you know, there's a there's a, a reasonable understanding of what the world population is to the left of, uh, I think this is a 2021 uh, assessment that I used. And then to the right, you can see how things change. And one of the things you see is, is Africa, which is actually a gigantic continent, becomes much more populous. Uh, and most of the rest of the parts of the world actually either decline or at best stay uh, stay constant. Now, one of the things that we worry about, of course, is the carrying uh, capacity of the planet. And one of the things you really don't want is you don't want that number to go up forever. Uh, and the thing that you normally uh, one uh, thinks of as being sort of the, 
a governor, if you if you will, on this, uh, really revolves around uh, prosperity. So basically, the less wealthy the country, um, probably the more. Uh, uh, the less likely there'll be, um, uh, the, the higher birth rates will be. And there's a variety of reasons for those, mostly uh, social in nature. Um, but in the US, uh, in Europe, uh, in Russia, in Japan, uh, in particular, uh, the native populations are, are for the most part below replacement rate. In the US, uh, we're largely maintained by immigrants kind of making, making up the difference. And there's a lot of discussion about collapses coming in China uh, and Russia uh, as uh, the number of retired there rise and the number of workers decline. So there's big things uh, big things coming but for the next uh, for the next uh, 75 years or so the population of the planet is going to grow now next slide uh, talks a little bit about how wealth is distributed so this is kind of an interesting plot to me um, again uh, what it does is it looks at where uh, that wealth is uh, around the world uh, let's sort of put that aside for the moment and just look at the peak there the peak is somewhere around 450 euros and of course a euro and a dollar are about the same things today so we can sort of think of those uh, as dollars. Now, this is a, a monthly income, so you multiply that by uh, 12, uh, and you go to the next slide. Uh, and what you find is that you're at the far left side of this curve here. So this curve here looks at, uh, in effect, as a population becomes wealthier, as you change that GDP per capita, how does their consumption rate of various, uh, uh, various resources change? And so you might think, oh, you know, steel and copper, there's going to be a lot of that. Well, not so much. Uh, you, these numbers actually come from experience of the industrialized world. And you have to sort of remember that they're not going to put, be putting in landlines uh, for, for a telephone system. And for that matter, they not, may not be sort of putting in central uh, power grid systems. They may be all locally generated uh, or largely locally generated uh, uh, renewables. Uh, so copper may be even lower here, right, as you move to the right. However, the one thing that you really see happening as people get wealthier is they want to improve their diet. In particular, they want meat. And you do see electrical and power usage go up as well. So we're going to focus on those as we move forward and ask what happens. One of the things I should just mention now, and I think most folk, folks on here know, um, meat is actually environmentally, um, uh, for the most part, you know, particularly if you're talking cattle, uh, it is not a um, it is not an enviro environmentally uh, friendly activity for a variety of reasons, uh, and there's only really a limited amount of the planet that you can use for uh, for doing that, uh, because you have to generate so much uh, feed for the meat. You know, roughly 12 pounds of feed for a pound for a for a pound of meat from a cow. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, you really run out of uh, you, you run out of you run out of room pretty quickly. So, what do you do about that? Well, uh, if we go to the next slide, you see that one of the things that we could think about doing is going to the ocean. The only problem with that is that the wild fisheries have been mm, they've been pretty overfished. Um, there's a number of different plots of them. I like this one here. It kind of shows catches per hundred hooks uh, in 1958. Uh, and then it, you come across in 1999, and you can see there's been an enormous drop off. And of course, a, a lot of this is particularly heavy fishing in the Western Pacific. Uh, the Chinese, in particular, have really industrialized uh, industrialized fishing. And uh, if you look at where there's been big impacts on fisheries in the world, a lot of it's been in the Southern Oceans uh, uh, over the last over the last few decades. So fish from the sea, we're not going to be getting more of those. If anything, we're going to be getting less. So next slide, please. Uh, well, one of the things to note is that uh, is that in the terrestrial environment, if we were still hunter gatherers, uh, we couldn't support the population that we have uh, uh, on the planet at all. 
um, what enabled us to sustain more people was the transition to farming. And of course, uh, getting better and better at farming, really starting about 10,000 years ago. And one measure to that is looking at what fraction of uh, animals and uh, plants uh, domesticated today um, were, domest uh, were domesticated a certain number of years ago. And what you can see is that curve picks up about 10,000 years ago for the terrestrial environment and really picks up less than 100 years ago for the marine environment. Now, you can find aquaculture back in Roman times. Uh, you know, it's been around for a while, but on very small scales. So the question really is, 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 is aquaculture going to replace the wild fisheries? Uh, can aquaculture um, provide the meat and protein uh, that a growing population and hopefully a more prosperous uh, population of the planet want. And by the way, the meat on the menu, that right curve there is from FAO. Um, so it sort of echoes some of the earlier, uh, the earlier ones looking at, at how those demographics might affect uh, consumption and what you need. So next slide. So here's what, uh, here's what you see in aquaculture. First of all, a lot of aquaculture occurs in the terrestrial environment. So you find it in ponds uh, and pools. Uh, but what you really need to do to really grow aquaculture is you have to move offshore. And in particular, you have to move pretty far offshore. Because if you're in the coastal environment, uh, in the near coastal environment, um, you know what you want to do is you want to put it someplace that's sheltered, uh, you know, that's uh, logistically convenient. Um, the shallow. It turns out there's not, as I as you saw from those earlier curves, there's not really that much ocean like that. Um, so as a consequence, you have to come up with the technologies to be able to put your aqua put your aquaculture pens out at sea in places where the water conditions might be rougher, where you might not be able to get out to service them all the time. And by the way, you don't want to keep them on the surface of the water. You want to keep them down deep and or at least below uh, below the surface wave action. And that creates a whole set of challenges, actually, uh, because including the fish uh, that you uh, that you grow, many of the fish that we're used to eating like salmon, expect to come to the surface of uh, uh, for to gulp air for their swim bladders. So as a consequence, access to the atmosphere is actually a necessity for a lot of fishes. So so there's a but not every fish. Kobe is an example of a bottom dweller that uh, is has uh, very popular in some parts of the world. India maybe become a very good aquaculture fish. Uh, so that's the one that's actually being raised in, in these pens here. Now, I like this plot here to the right because it's wrong. Uh, I got this, uh, I, you know, I, I think I got this uh, uh, back uh, probably over 10, 10 years ago, well, not quite 10 years ago, I guess. Uh, and it looked like aquaculture was going to overtake wild fisheries, you know, sometime around maybe 2030 or so. In fact, it's already happened. So aquaculture is actually is actually currently producing more fish than the wild capture fisheries. Now, uh, we have to keep in mind we're in the early days of aquaculture. Uh, aquaculture has been a trial and error type thing. It's not really a science uh, as of yet. And so there's a long way to go in that domain. Uh, to get good at it, to understand how to do it without damaging the environment, uh, and to figure out how to do it economically and to, to automate it so that you can do it in places uh, where, uh, uh, where uh, um, you aren't impacting other, uh, other activities. So, so at any rate, uh, aquaculture, uh, very interesting thing uh, that's going on today, and I think uh, something which is going to continue to mature in, in the coming decades. So next slide, please. So energy consumption, um, I, I love Gapminder. Uh, it is a uh, I apologize if you haven't played with it and you go check it out, you probably are going to lose this entire weekend to it. It is a total, if you're a data geek, it is a, it is a black hole of time. Uh, it's really a, a fabulous, a fabulous little tool. So if you look at this here, um, if you look at it, at cars, trucks, buses per thousand people as a function of, of income per person, uh, what you can see is it's on a log log scale, it's kind of a straight line, US up at the top. Uh, and you can imagine as the world gets more proper, prosperous and it moves to the right, you know, there's more of these. And uh, as a consequence, energy consumption in the world goes up. 
and it's not really reasonable to tell China, for example, you know, yeah, we're up at close to, I don't know, four or 500, um, you're down at 40, why don't you stay there? Why don't you, you know, that's, that's just not gonna, that's not gonna happen. So we have to, we have to expect that energy, uh, that energy consumption globally is going to continue to rise uh, with all kinds of consequences, uh, carbon dioxide being sort of the, the central one if we go back to climate. Next slide. But with enormous geopolitical um, uh, considerations as well. And so there's already an enormous amount of oil produced in the ocean. And so this is just a, uh, a, a plot of oil rigs uh, and uh, pipelines off the coast of uh, the US down in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see this is an underwater sense. This is not your pristine ocean environment where there are no humans, uh, although these are much further apart than you get a sense from here. Um, but this is beginning to become kind of what I think of as an industrial ocean. It's an ocean with a lot of uh, human activities, uh, industrial activities occurring inside of it. And uh, this type of ocean, you need to think about managing differently. And by the way, you need to think about protecting it differently. So um, this ocean doesn't have stuff which can come to shore in the case of a national emergency. It's going to be out there. Uh, and if you think about how long it took to shut down that, uh, that uh, enormous calamity that Deepwater Horizon was, it took almost a year, right, to close that down. So look at every one of these is almost not every one of these in the deep water is a potential uh, deep water horizon. So, so we have an enormous exposure here uh, in, the, uh, in the marine environment as, as well. Next slide, please. So this is just to say that out there associated with each one of those pink dots in deep water is billions of dollars of hardware on the seafloor. And some of those things there are three stories high. They're enormous. Um, and it's all stuff that in a terrestrial environment is on land. Uh, in the ocean environment, you've taken all that equipment, you put it down in the seafloor, you've cabled it in. Uh, and there's enormous discussions about how to make sure that's safe, uh, how to monitor it, how to inspect it. Uh, fundamentally, it's just all possible because of robotics. It's all being done with ROVs. Um, but there's a big push to move across to what are called resident vehicles. And resident vehicles are basically robotic systems that are resident in this infrastructure and stay there and aren't recovered and operated from a ship but operate from the infrastructure you have out there. So big changes coming probably in what is a very conservative community, but a community which builds uh, engineering systems on a very large, on a very large scale. Next slide. Now, the other thing, of course, that's coming to the offshore environment is wind energy. Uh, and wind, wind energy, this is just a picture that I have from Massachusetts. Uh, winds are roughly twice as high over the ocean as over land. That means you're producing eight times as much power. Um, there's big wind farms that are going in in that lower right-hand red corner off of, uh, off of uh, Nantucket and south of the vineyard in particular, and indeed all up and down the, all up and down the East Coast. And this infrastructure uh, is gigantic. Some of, these, some of these towers getting put out there are literally getting to be the size of the Eiffel Tower. Next slide. Of course, one of the challenges here is that there are other people out there using that ocean environment. Currently, it's fishermen, but there's a lot of discussion about once you start putting in these wind, uh, these the, these wind farms out there, um, can you use the infrastructure that you're building up on land in order to also do other things out there? So, can you use that all region for aquaculture? Can you get double duty from the from the same area? And by the way, this is going to be transformative for coastal communities. New Bed Bedford, once one of the wealthiest uh, cities in the country, now sort of capital of meth. It's a desperate, uh, desperate, dirty, dangerous place. Uh, but, you know, maybe coming back again because it will be a port serving a lot of the offshore wind farms. So this is going to be transformative for ocean communities in the U.S. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the robots, AI, and the future ocean. I'm going to move through this quickly because I think this group probably knows this stuff um, pretty well. Next slide. Um, I'll just say that in early 20. 
14 when uh, the Malaysian airliner was lost off of, uh, we believe, off of Australia. Um, mostly ships responded to that. Um, there was one AUV out there at the time. Uh, I was still on the board of Bluefin Robotics. We had a vehicle out being tested in Hawaii. Uh, we curtailed those tests and sent it directly to the Indian Ocean. So most of those early tests were done with ships and you know one AUV. Um, they labored on that for many years um, uh, through that very large area there, 120,000 square kilometers, just in that little red box down at the lower right. This is an enormous amount of ocean that they were searching to find this aircraft. And if you go to the next slide, um, by 2018, what had happened is Ocean Infinity had uh, developed their whole system of a surface vessel with a fleet of surface autonomous surface vehicles, which in turn supported eight uh, mapping vehicles down on the seafloor. And in three months out there, uh, they actually achieved as much uh, as the entire previous survey out there. So they is a phenomenal and very, very high survey quality. So this is sort of the beginning of uh, the move to uh, robotic systems and sort of an industrial scale for surveying and mapping the seafloor. Uh, very exciting things. Uh, Ocean Infinity is probably going to go back there again. Uh, I think from a, a, a naval maritime perspective, our challenge is achieving something like this without the surface vessel. So next slide, please. So this is, this is just to say this idea of using multiple vehicles is something that the oceanographic community has, has known about for a while. So this is a field program from 2003. It's a cartoon, but the field experiment actually occurred. As you strip away the ocean there, what you see is a heterogeneous fleet of underwater vehicles, uh, buoyancy driven gliders, propeller vehicles, drifters, uh, 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 moorings, uh, and then a, a few human occupied assets out there as well. Um, so we understand very well that the ocean is a highly variable environment. And if you're going to in effect uh, study it, you really need to use uh, large numbers of sy systems. And uh, this, is, this is something that was largely funded by O&R. Next slide, please. So this is just to say that if you take all that data and you push it into an oceanographic model, you start getting a picture of the ocean, which is unlike anything you ever had before. Uh, and one of the things you can see is you have these ocean structures out there, which are, those are probably about 200 kilometers across, those big swirling things. And then there's larger red areas, the way this is plotted, it shows sort of temperature anomalies in the ocean environment. And really what we'd like to be able to do is to do for the ocean what we take for granted in the atmosphere, which is to predict its state. We'd like to be able to predict its state over the near term, um, but we'd also like to be able to predict its state over the long term for climate. And so these are one of the things that really is of critical uh, importance to the nation, um, to different industries uh, and to society in different ways, but on different timescales. So next slide. So the other thing that's happening, of course, is that we're these robots, which started out as things which required, you know, a first rate laboratory, uh, are increasingly becoming available uh, via, for example, Amazon. Uh, so they're becoming consumer robotics devices. Uh, you know, iRobots just had their exit for almost $2 billion. So this is clearly here to stay. And if you go to the next slide, one of the things you realize is uh, that, in fact, there's a lot of ways to pick up the, um, the tools you need to make robots online. So we'll just say the genie's out of the bag. Uh, we're not going to be the only ones building robots in the future. These are going to be things which are going to be operated on, uh, you know, internationally. And they're not always going to require millions of dollars to build, although certain capabilities on there, like communications and navigation, may be something that uh, provides a a very big uh, differential for the folks that have the capabilities and the money. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is really kind of getting to the final discussion, which really revolves around uh, how does this, you know, how does this affect us from a national security perspective? Next slide. Um, one of the things that you really sort of have to understand is that the ocean is a hodgepodge 
of, uh, of different types, different regions. There's territorial waters to 12 miles offshore, uh, you know, how far you kind of close to how far you could shoot a cannon. Uh, then there's exclusive economic zones to 200 meter, uh, 200 kilometers offshore, which are not the same as territorial waters, but they do give you rights for the um, for the economic resources in that environment. Uh, and then there's the high seas. And, and then there's portions of the high sea. And the high seas are basically international in nature. And there's something called the, uh, the UN law of the sea or UNCLOS, um, which governs in effect uh, the process for extracting resources from the high seas. So there's a couple of interesting things here. The US is roughly 50% ocean and 50% terrestrial environment. We're one of the largest owners of ocean in the world. Uh, France owns a little bit more ocean than we do, courtesy of all of their Pacific islands. Uh, Russia's up there. China owns very little, which actually explains um, perhaps partly why they're so vigorous about pursuing uh, their South China Sea claims, which, by the way, don't conform to any of the treaties or any of the, the, the agreements. Uh, one of the things you'll see on here as well is crosshatched areas, and those crosshatched areas are regions where you can go into the you can go in and you can argue that there's a continental shelf extension, which is really part of your, an extension of your terrestrial environment and that you should get that. And as you look up above there, um, the Arctic is lots of crosshatch. And by the way, there's conflicts all over the place here um, uh, between countries uh, who think they're, they have you know, one or the other has the economic exclusive zone, including between the US and Canada uh, up there uh, in the Arctic. Next slide. So supporting, uh, I think, access to all of this is the growth of uh, a vibrant uh, ecosystem of marine robotic systems. And one of the things I commented was the eastern seaboard used to be filled with shipyards. Well, it's interesting that some of those shipyards are now robotics companies. Uh, in the New England area, that kind of built on a foundation of robotics companies in the New England area, um, and then kind of sprung out of the educational organizations up there. I was at MIT when we spun Bluefin out, and uh, Woods Hole, of course, spun out Hydroid, and New London has a big uh, naval contingent down there, and a lot of folks leave that and come into uh, to little startup companies as well. So uh, this, is, this is really kind of the foundation, which allows you to do what the next slide depicts, and uh, the next slide is create these ocean industries. And uh, I've already been talking about these. So this is uh, oil. Um, I haven't talked about uh, uh, haven't talked about telecoms, but uh, wind, uh, deep sea mining, uh, aquaculture. These are all things which are being built on that automation capability in the ocean environment. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the other things to think about, though, is that if you start thinking about this from a naval perspective and you start thinking that you're going to doing, be doing this with robots, is you think about how you're going to support uh, operations in, in, in far-flung parts of the world. And, of course, navies in, uh, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, occupied other parts of the world largely so that they could stage, uh, uh, stage coal or oil. Um, to their dispersed naval fleets. For us, uh, it's not obvious to me that we need terrestrial environment. Maybe we can all do this on the ocean floor. And so the picture on the right is, in fact, from the oil and gas, uh, but they're already building big infrastructure down there. And so, you know, this might be a very different world uh, than the world of a couple hundred years ago in terms of thinking about how you stage things. Next slide. Arctic, uh, I'm going to skip by this because I realize I'm, I'm pretty late here, but I would just say that the next slide, the Arctic Ocean has some very interesting problems. There's methane seeps at the right, hydrothermal vents on, uh, excuse me, on the left, uh, hydrothermal vents on the right. These are both sources of fear and sources of interest uh, uh, from the perspective of powering systems. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that between sun, wind, and uh, temperature difference between the ocean and atmosphere, you can actually generate a fair bit of power up there in the Arctic. Uh, you know, sun goes away in winter, um, wind is kind of there year round, the temperature difference goes away in the summer, but combining them, you can actually power yourself kind of year round. Next slide. Five more minutes, Jim. 
Okay, I'm on my last slide here, so hopefully we can get some questions in. So, so really, the point here is the ocean is changing dramatically, uh, and uh, in as I say, in our lifetimes, and human dependence on the ocean is increasing, and so we're seeing that for food, we're seeing that for energy, uh, we're seeing it actually for communications. I've had the, you know, the talk was long enough. I could have fit in a couple of other things as well. The robotics and AI systems that play Places like Applied Physics Lab are developing are really fundamental to transforming our interactions with the ocean and really enabling new industries and then allowing us to develop the new uh, approaches to national security that are going to allow us to protect our interests in the ocean environment. And so finally, I think we need to rethink how we frame our national security in, in terms of these developments. And I, I'll just say that, uh, you know, as you look at things like uh, the high seas, Many countries look at those like a country like Singapore, which is a very small country and hemmed in by Malaysia and Indonesia. It doesn't have anywhere to go for natural resources. It can go to the high seas. So those high seas actually may be the province of those landlocked countries that don't have resources that need to free themselves from dependency of uh, uh, you know some un unfriendly neighbor, perhaps. So with that, I'll end and, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks, Jim, for this fantastic presentation. And I'd like to tell the audience, if you have questions that we don't have time for, because we're only going to have time probably for one question here, please do put them in and, and Jim can answer them afterwards. So we have a couple of questions from Kevin Cropper. I'm going to read the second one he sent in. It says, APL is sending robotics to explore lunar oceans around other planets. What can we learn from here to help there or from there to help here? Yeah, so, so I, I tend to think of if you have a data point of one, um, you 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 never get an opportunity to think out of the box. So so when you're modeling an ocean and you're modeling the Earth's ocean, uh, uh, you're you're not driven to sort of think about uh, the physics uh, as it moves you beyond your comfort zone. So in effect, most of those climate models are tuned by fitting to historical data, which means you have a good chance of missing you know the really uh, dramatic events that might come. But as you go to oceans on other planets. Um, they really force you to think about your models in a more general uh, in a more general way. I mean, that's super demanding and and uh, to do. Um, but I think I think it, it just forces you to think big when it comes to oceans. And I will say that I find that uh, that particular problem extremely interesting. Uh, you know, boy, a whole separate conversation we can have about that. But we'll just say there is more ocean in the outer solar system, more liquid ocean in the outer solar system than in the inner solar system. So, so great, great questions there.